Hello, uh, good evening. Um, uh, for those of you who don't uh, know me, my name is Misha Glenny, and I am the recently appointed rector of the Institute for Human Sciences, and I've just taken up the position some three weeks ago. And um, it is a particular honor and privilege to be able to introduce my first lecture here at the IWM uh, in the form of John Dunn, who is a senior fellow with us, the Krzysztof Michalski uh, fellow at the moment, a world-renowned scholar of politics. Welcome, John. We're very pleased to have you here. John is Emeritus Professor of Political Theory at King's College, Cambridge, and although he has that uh, uh, that epithet emeritus, uh, he just revealed to me that he still teaches undergraduates on a regular, on a regular basis at uh, King's. He's also the Harkness Fellow at Harvard, a visiting professor at the Graduate School of Social Sciences and Humanities in Chiba, uh, at Chiba University in Japan, and he has an extremely rich array of uh, published works which have been translated into many languages. And he certainly doesn't shy away from the big topics. He has considered things such as revolution, regime collapse and reconstruction, the history, development and, and future of democracy and the globalization of, of political thinking. Now, um, I think in these times that we're experiencing, many of these subjects are of extreme relevance to what the world is having to deal with. And from his first book, The Political Thought of John Locke, up to the more, uh, uh, his more recent works, such as Breaking Democracy's Spell, John has consistently tried to engage with how politics underpins our societies, what the challenges are that democracies uh, are confronted with and how they might be able to deal with them. Obviously, our present predicament following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but not only the Russian invasion of Ukraine, many other issues that we're, we're dealing with at the moment are likely to be part of today's lecture because it has an extremely forbidding title, Civilizations, Barbarity, Conquest, Legitimacy, and Crimes of War. So we're going to listen to John's lecture now and then I'll ask a, a couple of follow-up questions before uh, throwing it onto the, uh, onto the floor. So John, if you'd uh, like to take the floor. We're keen to hear your words. Thank you very much, Misha. Um, I'm going to speak, of course, uh, about the war in Ukraine and what I think it means. That's the point of the title. But before I start, I need, as trustees of British charitable institutions are legally obliged to, to declare an interest. My wife, who's a British University teacher, was born in Odessa and has her second home and, in effect, her second life there. And she was there late in January this year with our four-year-old daughter. So this is my war, too. I'm speaking, as you can see and hear for yourselves, as a pretty antiquated British University teacher. So what I think and have to say reflects the sensibility and experiences of my own life. Born in England a few months after Dunkirk as the son and grandson of officers in the British Army, when my country was facing the Third Reich, more or less alone, and had little rational expectation of surviving its onslaught. So that's the life from which what I have to say comes as all human thinking has always come and had to come from the particular time and space-bound lives of an individual human being. I don't uh, apologize for its provenance because it makes no sense for anyone to apologize for who they are. 
You should apologise for what you've done and left undone, not for the contingencies of your birth and upbringing or the settings through which you moved before you could hope to choose for yourself. For me, it's a very great privilege for which I'm duly grateful, I hope, to speak under the auspices of the Institute that's provided such a home for a number of people I care about and admire greatly, especially my brilliant, brave and tragic pupil, Tony Jutt, for Charles Taylor, 90 years old last year, who opened so many vistas for me when I was first trying to learn to think about the history of human imagination and especially the human imagination of politics. And for Tim Snyder, who has written and spoken for the miseries and heroisms of the bloodlands more eloquently and searchingly than any other Anglophone scholar, and far more powerfully and discerningly, I think, than any career politician of whom I'm aware. I don't think of um, President Zelensky as a career politician. It's important for me, though, that I don't mean what I'm trying to say to be addressed um, primarily to you as the audience here tonight in this ancient and extraordinary city, or the citizens of the NATO powers, a military alliance to which my country belongs and about which over uh, the decades of its existence I've very often had quite ambivalent feelings. The audience I centrally have written it for isn't mainly for you who have had the courtesy and optimism to come to listen to it tonight, but for one which couldn't be here. For the many peoples of the great mass of the world beyond our borders to the east and south, and any of their citizens I could sanely hope my words might sooner or later reach. And most especially I have in mind the Chinese listeners to whom I was invited to speak this month in the Second China Global Forum, but couldn't agree to uh, because I knew and had to tell my prospective hosts and hostesses that they couldn't show in the People's Republic at this point what I would have to say and say as clearly and forcefully as I can. Uh, they said, of course, well, couldn't you just talk about something else? but I'm afraid I couldn't talk about something else now. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February of this year, or to put it more accurately, since it was his choice and his alone to launch it, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, has cast a glaring new light on a very old but ever more urgent question. Are there actually any terms on which the human population of the world could still hope to live with one another in peace and personal freedom into a future of many generations? Could we still create, even now together, a modest vivendi of real duration? A modest vivendi which could hope to last for many generations of human experience and action, last into in an indefinite human future. We know now, as we didn't yet in the year 81 years ago when I was born, that any future generational horizon is going to be in ever starker jeopardy because of the colossal and ever less controllable harm we're still inflicting as a species on our global habitat. We know, as we could have known in much of Europe for at least the last three centuries, that the world was then, as it mercilessly remains, a vast distance from realising those terms, and that it couldn't in principle realise them at all rapidly. We still have only a tiny repertoire of forms through which to try to act collectively on any scale. International agencies, civilizations, maybe, states, peoples, or if you prefer, nations, each of doubtful efficacy and eminently questionable legitimacy. Which of those forms could still take how much of the strain 
of creating and sustaining that framework for sharing the earth and how and why could war still feature as anything but grounds for despair within that ever more desperate struggle. War, melodramatically, is a more immediate and overwhelming threat to the ways of life of the vast majority of the world's human population now than it's been for at least six decades, or at the very least, ever since the world held two hostile thermonuclear strike forces, because that alone has always placed it at risk of global devastation, more or less by accident. It's arguably in greater immediate danger at this point of utter destruction as a result of deliberate human choices than it's ever been before. Mutual assured destruction did in the end prove to carry a fair amount of rational inhibitive force for several decades during the Cold War. And we need to recognize how reckless it was to choose to dismantle the structure through which that force was exerted. You also need to recognize whose choice it was to do the dismantling. So, so much for the occasion for what I'll have to say. But what are the terms under which I've chosen to speak? The civilization is the grandest, largest, most enduring unit that humans have yet created for trying to live together for the better over time. It's not a bounded territorial unit or an integrated unit of coercive control and putative authority, as any state must aspire to be, nor is it an immense and opaque tissue of instrumental exchange, like the global market. Every civilization is an edifice of value and a focus of pride for those who see and feel themselves as belonging to it. It necessarily values itself, but it always has more discretion over how far to value any other civilization and risk its own diminution by doing so. Barbarity, by definition, my definition, the sense in which it appears in the title I have, barbarity, by definition, is the enemy of any civilization a vacuum of value and a menace to any hope that humans on any scale can live together for the better. Barbarity isn't other people's, it's what human beings must not do. It lurks permanently within every civilization, blunting the aspirations of all who belong to it whenever it breaks out into the open and cancelling most of the value of the civilization itself. Plainly, it's not an ethnographic category in the way I'm thinking of it, a full and accurate description of any grouping of human beings at a particular point in time. Rather, it's a fiercely assertive normative category with a very volatile hold on any of us over time, especially in time of war. The essence of barbarity is the destruction of human value, at worst, on a colossal scale. The peak episodes of barbarity in the last century were Germany's Third Reich and the Japanese imperial assault on China, Southeast Asia, and in the end, with wild imprudence, the United States of America. That time, barbarity was defeated, and defeated in the end by means all too barbarous in themselves. I didn't see with my own eyes the relics of that barbarity in Japan itself until four decades later, when, even in Hiroshima, they'd been largely tamed into an edifying tourist spectacle. And the vast firestorms which swept through Tokyo and its other great cities were just a memory, and one which those who could still remember them on the whole preferred to keep to themselves. But I did, however, as a young child, driven through the ruins of Hamburg in my father's army staff car a year or two later, I did see some of the destruction wreaked there by the Allied bomber forces. <laughs>
So I knew long before I tried to think about such things that barbarity is inseparable from war and can't readily be confined to those who fight on a wholly unjust basis. Barbarity never simply disappears from the world, although it can die down for quite long periods over much of the world's surface. It's been prominent enough in recent decades in Afghanistan and Iraq, in Syria and Libya, in Yemen, in Central Africa and Ethiopia. Today, appallingly, it's come back on a huge scale in Europe itself, the continent that had prided itself so much for most of my lifetime on having put war firmly behind it. In doing so, it's brought into increasingly direct confrontation two great military powers, each fully equipped to destroy the human world by choice. Why begin to think of this huge crisis through, of all categories, the category of civilization? One in the worst of odor with social scientists and widely seen as politically toxic. None of the three most prominent modern thinkers who focused extensively on it as a category, the British historian and student of international affairs, Arnold Toynbee, the cosmopolitan sociologist, Norbert Elias, nor the American political scientist, Samuel Huntington, did so in a way which much illuminates what's happening now. I begin from it now because there's nothing else beyond it for us still to appeal to. In a great European city like this one, those of us who come from Europe see ourselves naturally from the horizon of our own continent, and the value register through which we think and feel is a historical product of the history of that continent over a very long time. Three or so centuries ago, almost everyone who held articulated beliefs about value for human beings in this city and others to the west of it, believed they lived in a world designed and made by an omnipotent and beneficent creator. When all else failed them, as of course it frequently did, they could and often did appeal to heaven itself. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered in the alpine valleys cold, wrote the great English poet John Milton. Now, even most of those who still believe there to be a heaven would seldom think to look to it for practical aid, especially in conditions of great collective peril. In a global crisis <coughs> as acute as this one, the bearers of any civilization have no choice but to reach out as bravely and lucidly as they can to the many other civilizations still active in the world and to appeal to what those value too. That appeal may always fail. It had plainly failed already in the case of Russia itself for all its dazzling literary, musical and artistic heritage when the Metropolitan of Russia's Orthodox Church took up Putin's invitation, I don't suppose it was exactly an invitation, but you understand what I mean, to bless the war he had unleashed. And so many other Russian citizens cheered it so heartlessly and brutally on its way. To reach that degree of abandon of human decency has required Russia's citizens to submit to a vast befuddlement and to embrace a picture of the huge majority of Ukraine's inhabitants, which is utterly ludicrous to anyone who has been there within the last few years. More disconcertingly still, it required them too to succumb to attitudes towards other human beings which are shockingly vicious. No war brings out mainly what is best in human beings especially when it becomes at all intense, lasts for any length of time, and involves much of a population at all directly. But this war has barely begun yet for most of Russia's citizens, except those unlucky enough 
to be drafted to fight in person. At most, it's interfered a bit with their consumption opportunities, and already more than a third of them have expressed themselves to pollsters happy to unleash thermonuclear weapons on the people their leader has chosen deliberately to attack. In unleashing that attack at this point in his personal tenure of power, Vladimir Putin has done something truly terrible. He has made himself an enemy of the human race as a whole, drastically deepened the pressing threat he's already faced to any secure and collectively acceptable future, and sharply worsened its prospects for preserving the world as a viable human habitat on any scale into a lengthy future. In his own eyes, as he told his subjects and the world at large, he did so to re-establish and reassert Russia's power in the world, and do so on behalf of its historical civilization. Hence the need and the occasion for the Metropolitan's sleazy blessing. Sorry. Most civilizations in the world today don't view their own value through the prism of conquest. None, in face of the practical horizon of our species, can any longer afford to. Seen domestically, the rule of civilization must always be a regime of peace. But every civilization, like almost every extant state, won its territorial and demographic extension and established whatever sway it now holds over its population, largely through military conquest. Territoriality has never defined itself and never could do so. Political incorporation and subjection have always issued largely from armed coercion. Most civilizations across human history have viewed their own military extension unapologetically and proudly. It's inherently easier to distinguish civilization from barbarity at any point in time if you're not at the receiving end. Now that human beings have accumulated the power to destroy the conditions of their own existence, whether all but instantaneously or by relatively slow and cumulative ecological degradation, any hope for the human future requires that civilizations can and will learn not merely to coexist in peace, but also to cooperate closely and unreservedly together in arresting ecological degradation and reversing of as much of it as can still be reversed. They need, and need more urgently than ever before, to arrest barbarity across the world. They have no sane choice but to implement that coexistence and cooperation predominantly through the existing system of states and its fragile structures for acting internationally. Civilizations can't govern, and most of the states which now claim to govern for them still do so quite ineffectually. The miserably and in many ways absurdly disunited United Nations is a comprehensively proven failure at governing the world. How could it hope to do anything of the kind when its principal instrument for uniting for peace, the Security Council, contains a power which has chosen to make itself the enemy of mankind. It matters more than it ever has before how far the states of today can exercise their power to rule legitimately. All states, of course, claim to do so, in fact, by exercising the power they need for the purpose and by doing so by right. But both claims are always to some degree strained in practice, and the two are quite readily confounded. It's the claim to rule by right which is voided by barbarity, and it can never hold beyond a state's own territorial frontier. The states of today offer a miscellany of grounds for viewing their own rule as legitimate, 
from the explicit choices of their own citizens to the evident benefits those citizens derive from being ruled as they are, and others too, of course. None of those grounds runs through conquest as such, and none any longer can afford to. To make war on another state today on any grounds but immediate territorial self-defense or resistance to unprovoked aggression cannot be legitimate. It is a war crime in itself. To attack civilian populations on a vast scale, destroy whole cities, and deliberately kill women and children in huge numbers decisively destroys the legitimacy of any state which decides to undertake it. Few, if any, states are qualified to judge the domestic legitimacy of another regime. But international aggression is far easier to judge, and even states of quite partial or even parlous legitimacy are fully equipped to do so. The Russian Republic, under its present leadership, has voided any historical claim it may ever have held to be a site of civilization. In choosing the way of barbarity, it's made itself the enemy of the human future as a whole, a state run by criminals and answerable to the peoples of every other state for the crimes they continue blatantly to commit. The case for any political regime is fragile, poor, partial, and always very far from transparent. The case against barbarity is immediate, peremptory, and conclusive. It vaporizes any claim to act by right and with due entitlement. The sole compelling claimant to act coercively and with due entitlement in the world in which we now live is still a state or an agency directly or indirectly authorized to do so by one or more states. Whenever an international court of any kind claims the right and authority to adjudicate and do justice, it does so always on the basis of a jurisdiction conferred on it, usually by treaty, by a larger or smaller number of states. And whenever it succeeds in enforcing that jurisdiction, which is not that often, it does so invariably by courtesy of the aid of one or more states. When the United Nations was created, it embodied the aspiration, as it proved pretty transitory, to establish an authority above states to secure peace between them and their human populations by exerting that authority. But it was paralyzed from the start in seeking to do so whenever it was needed most urgently by the composition of the body entrusting to do the enforcing the Security Council and the all too effective veto exercised by its founding members. So if there's still no effective authority to secure peace or enforce justice above states, how and why do states themselves, or any amongst their number, hold the authority to secure peace and impose justice within their own territories? We prefer on the whole now, in the continent which invented the modern conception of the state, which has come to furnish the political and legal architecture of today's world, to suppose that they do so by being legitimate, and that their legitimacy in turn comes from us, from their citizens, conferring it voluntarily upon them and adjusting at fairly reliable intervals to whom exactly we're still content to consign it. We're distinctly less clear which of the numerous other states across the world which conspicuously failed to conduct themselves in that way are indeed fully legitimate, and even less clear on where exactly to draw the line between the convincingly legitimate and the flagrantly illegitimate, or quite why it's right to draw it there, not somewhere entirely different. But that's not the way that matters are seen by very many people in other countries, whether they happen to find themselves located inside the core institutions of the state itself or nakedly subject to those who are. It's very hard for Europeans, because of their continent's history, 
not to view themselves as the source and criterion of political right. But the global confrontation today, in that confrontation, that sometimes all but automatic assumption is politically disastrous because it's so ludicrously egocentric. It's also damagingly ingenuous about the sources of whatever degree of legitimacy their own states have contrived to achieve and sustain within their own borders. You can see that most clearly by considering the basis of territoriality. What makes a state a state is a relation between a bounded territory, a structure of law and government, and a human population which the latter regulates and governs. The relation between that population and its government may or may not be negotiated over time by its members choosing for themselves between the candidates to govern it whom they find themselves offered. But that was very seldom indeed the way it was initially established. The huge majority of states in the world today are ascertainably the result of military conquest, every bit as much so on the continent of Europe itself as anywhere else. Those conquests were virtually never the outcome of anything plausibly conceived as a just war, but virtually always the product of armed assault or strategies of dynastic appropriation. As point as conspicuous in the built environment today in Vienna as anywhere else in the world. Even for those few countries outside Europe, lucky or clever enough to escape conquest or devastating molestation from the European continent, it is merely ludicrous to see that history as a basis of right in any way superior to their own. And for the very considerable number of countries that were at one point or another deliberately subjugated or massively disrupted through the exercise of European military and naval power, it is actively and intensely offensive. So the question of where the legitimacy of the state does come from, when and where and if it comes at all, is harder and more perturbing. And the need to pose that question now as we survey the shaky edifice of human interaction across the globe and open our eyes and ears to the scale and ferocity of the challenges which face our species is more urgent than it's ever been before in our collective history. There's no chance whatever of there proving to be a simple and compelling formula which will answer that question for us and do so right across the living membership of our species, if only it were conveyed to them lucidly and accurately enough through the most interminable and magically power-extricated process of deliberation. There's also, I'm afraid, no chance of extricating it in that way, now or in any future we can coherently imagine, from the catastrophically unequal and unjust structuring of power between living human beings across the world. It's not merely that the history which has produced that outcome has been to such a large degree a history of brutality, plunder and exploitation, a history of barbarity. The very capacity to act today of all living human beings necessarily reflects that terrible history. I, I don't mean just to wring my hands in incoherent shame or still more incoherent guilt at the thought of all that suffering or even at the thought of the motley role my own forebears may have played and in a few cases ascertainably did play in small fragments of it. I merely wish to underline the simple political fact that it can't be to that history, and still less from any complacency we may personally happen to feel about how, about how it's come out at present in our own countries, that we can hope to appeal to much of the world's population as grounds for recognising the pressing need to act together against a terrifying common threat. There's one and only one need in a world so hideously unjust, which is indeed common to every human being over time, the need to survive and live a life worth living for as long as they have the opportunity to do so.
for huge numbers of human beings throughout human history, that's not been the life available to them. And we're a better place today than ever before to judge for quite how many of us it still remains far from being so. Just think of the terrible famines burgeoning across Africa and the global food crisis unleashed by Putin's war. When the idea of the state was first articulated really clearly in the pages of Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan, and some time before it was realized at all fully anywhere in the political, economic, and social structures of the historical world, it was on the need to survive and live a life worth living that Hobbes grounded his argument that all human beings do need the protection of a state and have compelling reason to give their allegiance to and to obey one if they're fortunate enough to find themselves subject to it. No state on its own can provide that protection and furnish its subjects with the life they have come to see and feel as worth living in a global habitat which is rapidly being destroyed. Only a union of states, and perhaps only a, a union of nations which identifies those states as their own, could hope to act together to arrest that hectic process of destruction, still less begin to reverse it. Any such union, unsurprisingly, has always proved far beyond our reach so far in our collective history. Whatever terminological promises to the contrary may have been proclaimed in prominent settings or taken continuing institutional shape for significant periods of time. The grim circumstances of the present could scarcely be less propitious for a brisk movement in that direction. But their very grimness is itself an index of its ever-growing urgency. The League of Nations and the United Nations each came into existence in the wake of terrible wars and with the mission to prevent the recurrence of any such war, and in so far as proved practicable, to prevent or briskly bring to an end any war at all. Today, once again, we have such a war on our own continent, and for the first time in human history, we have it in very close to real time on camera. Not, of course, in its full horror, with the hour-long rape and subsequent murder of mothers in front of their children and their beaten and toothless children sent off to tell the tale, painstakingly recorded on video for wider audiences, but with a huge surplus of directly, visually and orally recorded wanton destruction and catastrophe over what anyone could possibly take in, a, surpl a surplus which will go on and on mounting until the war comes to an end. It's that more than anything else, more even than watching the endlessly genocidal fantasies on Russian public media and the constant calls to go on to Warsaw and Tallinn and Prague and Berlin, which has forced the leaders of a very reluctant Europe to come to the aid of Ukraine's ravaged people. I don't mean that every bit of Europe was equally reluctant, but it is a summative judgment, I think, to come to the aid of Ukraine's ravaged people and its heroic armies and try belatedly to ensure that Putin's assault fails. Much of the rest of the world's population do not have the means to watch these horrors in the same way. And a very significant proportion also have little inclination to they either cannot or do not see them at all, or they see them and feel about them as other people's war. Some, of course, in Ethiopia or Mali, Nigeria or Yemen, in Syria or Myanmar, or actually scores of other countries, have long had and very much continue to have wars implacably of their own. For others, Ukraine, and its people, and their difficulties with one another and with their formidable neighbour just seem very far away. At one level, of course, the current predicament of Ukraine's people simply is, for most of the world's population, 
far too far away to mean anything at all personal, even for the modest proportion amongst them whose own lives aren't too fraught or desperate, but those of others in far-off countries of which they know little or nothing to mean anything at all. But at another level, of course, that natural and pre-reflected assumption may prove all too miserably misplaced. The combined menace of global warming and the devastation of Ukraine's food exports is already spreading famine and misery deeper and deeper into many of these countries. And the price shock from eliminating those exports can only intensify that effect and weaken both the will and the capacity of wealthier countries closer and more sympathetic to Ukraine come effectively to their aid and do so on the requisite scale and in time. The fluidity of global trade may have ebbed and its scale shrunk already at this point for political as well as medical reasons, but the inexorable rise in global temperature and the accentuated climatic volatility this already ensures continue regardless and the menace of global food insecurity rises sharply with them. It's no longer a refined spiritual intuition that no man is an island, but a brutal biological and physical fact. For the rich and powerful across the world, as for most members of its wealthier and more secure societies, this has yet to become a pressing practical consideration. But all of them, like all of us, across the generations are living on heavily borrowed time and with no coherent strategy whatever for managing the dizzying levels of temporal debt they've accumulated into a lengthy future. For all the extravagant disparities in their present life chances, they face at this point in the end a common doom and a doom they can only sanely hope to avert by learning whilst there is still time to act quite differently. In the hallowed medieval formula, omnes et singulatim, individually and together. It's of course quite possible that it's already too late to avert that doom, that there's nothing within the limits set by physics and chemistry that human agency retains the power to bring about, which could secure its collective rescue. But we certainly don't yet know that to be so, even if it does happen to be. And unless and until we do come to know that, it could scarcely prompt us to surrender the hope of a durable future for our species. In the meantime, those stark disparities in individual and collective life chances across the world have one clear and simple implication. They reflect, above all, disparities in power, For human beings, power is the reciprocal of responsibility. Those who are fortunate to have much, therefore owe correspondingly more. The incidence of famine is the simplest way to see that structure of responsibility. If human beings owe each other anything at all, they owe at least the duty, if they readily can, to prevent one another starve. Even as unsentimental a thinker as John Locke saw the free choice to fail to do that as murder and the guilt it carries and the shame it should occasion as just the same as murder. Unfortunately, as our collective life is now organised, we don't possess the practical capacity to prevent famine across the world And as the warming of the globe accelerates, we risk moving further and further away from being able to do so at an ever faster pace. But at this point still, shifts in political conflict which are quite discretionary and purposeful changes in distributive choice could readily reposition us to intervene promptly and effectively to prevent most of the famine that already occurs and stave off the far higher levels that are now imminent. For Locke, of course, the responsibility to do just that, had the need faced him in person, would have followed from his picture. Actually, I don't know what he would have done if it had faced him in person. He was quite a mean person, really. But 
for Locke, of course, the responsibility to do just that, had the need faced him in person, would have followed from his picture of the world as God's creation, and of humans as equal creatures assigned their roles, entitlements and responsibilities within it by his unchallengeable power and authority. But none of those presuppositions are needed to recognise the force of the judgment itself. Without some very special and evidently pertinent consideration, it's hard to see how anyone, on any basis, could defend the deliberate choice to let another human being starve. You might choose to starve your deadlier enemies with some insouciance, or, or not especially care that others of whom you were, would otherwise be wholly unaware are running out of food and water. But to choose, all on its own, for someone else to starve to death, if you could readily prevent them from doing so, would be a very strange human response. In a world in which human powers and life chances were not so desperately unequal, there might perhaps be a better shared responsibility to ensure life and lives worth living to all its human inhabitants. In our world, unfortunately, the structuring of responsibility is far more nebulous and the pressure to act on it correspondingly feebler. At this dire point in the destiny of our species, I've tried to argue, that's the occasion for acute fear. It's not a ground for equanimity. Very few of us really feel it that way so far, though more perhaps are at last beginning to. It's instructive to set it beside the assumption, widely shared in Europe until Putin's current invasion of Ukraine, that peace on this continent was a secure and virtually irreversible good, evinced by the intermittent tentacular expansion of the European Union, if less transparently by the forward movement of the NATO alliance. In the harsh glare of hindsight, that now looks disturbingly reminiscent of Christopher Clarke's portrait of Europe's then leaders sleepwalking into the catastrophe of the First World War, a narcoleptic or even necrotic condition of its people's political imaginations. What should we think now that we've been so brusquely woken up? You scarcely need to think at all to recognise that we urgently need peace and don't need to think at all hard to recognise, as I've tried to argue, that at this point we need it and need it right across the world, still more urgently than we've ever as a species needed it before. But within the species, of course, as has always been the case, we don't individually need it with anything like equal urgency. Those who need peace most urgently are always those who don't currently have it, those directly menaced in and by war. There have long been many millions of people who need it with that urgency across the world, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, and now there are millions who need it in Europe too. If you want to see the need for peace in our continent with your own eyes, all you need to do is look at the aerial photographs of the city of Mariupol and think of the tens and thousands of lives that have been terminated or ruined there in the last three months. Once you're dead, of course, you no longer need peace. The peace, peace for you could only come too late. Peace is a need for the living. Peace is what life requires for it to go on. It was to meet that need effectively that the idea of the state was first fully forged. It was forged, of course, as any complicated idea would have to be, out of a range of earlier ideas. But in its full elaboration, it consisted in one core purpose, to make and keep peace between a set of human beings. Those human beings in themselves lacked either the steady will or the dependable power to make and keep peace with one another. And each of them, hence, had good reason to submit their own will and judgment to its will and judgment and give it such power 
as they disposed of to aid it in securing that peace. Real states, of course, never quite realize that idea. The protection they provide is always seriously imperfect in practice and often not offered to many of their citizens with even a semblance of sincerity. Hobbes himself offered no magical formula for ensuring either efficacy or sincerity, and none, unfortunately, has been discovered in the centuries since he wrote. Whom exactly does Vladimir Putin protect, and from just what? States today, in all their heterogeneity, all demand obedience, but they vary greatly in, their strength of, in the strength of their claim to receive it. Today, as in 1651, each of them deserves allegiance only in so far as it does seek to provide protection and succeeds in doing so, and it deserves it only from those to whom it does provide that protection. When Putin's present war began, the Republic of Ukraine, like most other states in the world today, was not an especially effective state in quite a number of ways. But it's wholly false to suggest that it wasn't a state, and hasn't been one, throughout the term of its current president, fully and sincerely dedicated to the effort to provide protection and do so impartially for all its citizens. That's why for it, and, those of, and for those of its citizens who give it their full allegiance, this monstrous war is a wholly just war. While for the government of the Russian Federation and those of its citizens who've chosen to make it so wholeheartedly their own war too, it's a wholly unjust war. No doubt many of the latter have been duped by the government which has gone to such lengths to prevent them learning anything reliable about the world beyond their borders. But much that has happened in the invasion and much that many of Russia's citizens say with alacrity and apparent sincerity when questioned on the streets of Moscow or St. Petersburg suggests something far uglier. Not merely a government, but a fair proportion of a people quite at ease with the war in their name, launched and conducted without a trace of justice. I fear the same may well have been true in my own country with its long imperial past, if relatively seldom still in my own adult lifetime, definitely quite often for many in those of my father and mother. What matters about states isn't their origins, none of which are above suspicion. It's their present conduct and what that conduct makes it reasonable to believe about how they will conduct themselves in the future. The idea of the state was forged deliberately to counter and disempower a wide range of rival claims, especially claims advanced on the presumption of religious authority and from civic or group solidarities, what we might now call pluralist claims. Hobbes thought the former, the religious, necessarily specious, and the latter, the group ones, inherently divisive. He was not an enemy of cities or communities on any scale, still less of religious faith or worship, and he fully recognized that states themselves can be divisive if those who direct them choose to make them so. But he insisted that states, at least, in no way need to be, and that for them to be so was wholly against their interest and a serious threat to their stability and capacity to discharge their core purpose. Peace is a great good and a pressing need today for every individual human being and every human society, but it can't be secured just by recognizing the urgency and universality of that need. For there to be peace, it must be kept, and it can be kept only by providing effective protection against all who threaten it. It's hard, and perhaps simply impossible, to provide peace within the borders of a state against those who currently direct that state at all effectively. That's the story of um, 
political story of humanitarian intervention. Between states, it can be protected only by defeating any state which decides to violate it. Uniting to protect is still the constitutive purpose of the United Nations, and the deliberate and increasingly routine frustration of that purpose by the exercise of a veto by a permanent member of the Security Council remains the principal site of the UN's impotence as a peacekeeping agency. This is clearly against even the medium-term interest of every human population, however desperate and wretchedly misgoverned. It remains, unfortunately, clearly in the short-term interest of a number of those who still hold authority in several states which do hold a veto, and not always for the same states over time. For as long as it remains so constituted, the Security Council will remain a standing guarantee of global insecurity, an insecurity appallingly intensified ever since more than one state came to possess thermonuclear weapons, and was perhaps especially unnerving in the brief interval while only one single state did have them. From that time on, our species has stood in jeopardy to thermonuclear blackmail, to every threat to use those weapons regardless of the consequences. To implement that threat would always be a hideous gamble, but the impulse to level it once you'd acquired the weapons has often proved hard to resist, and isn't obviously deranged in the same way. It's unsurprising that this should have prompted nuclear proliferation on the scale that has already occurred, and short of a reliably effective union of states for peace, it's hard to see how that proliferation can, can ever be stopped. I don't know if there can be such a union, and even if there could be, it's fully evident that no one has the least idea how to create it. Until it does come into being, a great weight of responsibility falls on every effective state to judge when peace has been violated and do what it can to restore it. It falls more heavily the more powerful the state in question and the closer and ghastlier the violation. The war in Ukraine has launched a deluge of war crimes and it's a vast war crime in itself. It has wounded the civilizational claims of every civilization still clearly extant in the world and spread barbarity densely across a land in which at least as large a proportion of the population as anywhere else on Earth had chosen to and wished to live in peace and freedom. It's a land, too, which has long fed the peoples of very many other lands, and its devastation already ensures mass hunger across the world and may easily condemn millions far away from it to starve to death. It was launched gratuitously, and under the most ludicrous and shameful of pretexts. It was launched with hideous brutality and in utter cynicism. As soon as the assault began to falter, it was backed up by the threat to use thermonuclear weapons on any population, on the population of any state with the effrontery to impede it. If ever there has been a time to face down nuclear blackmail and restore a just pay peace, this is it. If there is to be a long-term and civilized future for our species, this is a war which the aggressor must lose. And every state whose citizens have the intelligence to recognize what such a future requires and the courage to face that blackmail must unite to ensure that the aggressor does. Civilization is quite a nebulous idea and a ready incitement to narcissistic illusion, but there is nothing nebulous about barbarity. I chose my title over two months ago, but I think it remains all too apt. As President Zelensky said eloquently in his address earlier this month, this is not a war of two armies, it's a war of two world views, a war waged by barbarians. This has never been a just world for its human inhabitants, and no one has ever had a clear conception of how it could be made one in practice. 
the nastier legacies of history can be palliated, but they can never be rectified. History necessarily, in Edward Albee's stinging phrase, is all blood under the bridge. But perhaps even the grim and perilous world in which we now live could still become, and if it could, it certainly should eventually be made into one in which every human being could live in peace and live a life worth living. Any hope of extended survival for human life on a civilised scale is quite extreme at this point, but it surely remains a rational horizon for collective human hope over time. In a world preserved in that form, if only in that form, it might still make sense to hope that all its human inhabitants could live in peace and live lives which were worth living. And even in that world, it would surely remain more extravagant to expect that that's what all of them would choose to. The struggle against barbarity is pervasive and ceaseless. At this point in time, it's assumed an unusually clear outline and its demands on all of us are just as pressing as they'd come to be for those who faced them on this and other continents in the bleak winter of 1941. There's no hope we will meet all those demands in full. The colossal crime of the war itself can't just be terminated abruptly by anything within our power. Until it is terminated, the innumerable individual crimes it continues to prompt will go on multiplying uncontrollably. The vast mountains of rubble will continue to pile up. The searing weight of pain will press ever harder and hundreds and thousands of further lives will be ruined forever. We've always failed as a species in the struggle against barbarity and the circumstances of the present preclude our fully succeeding now. But this time, as never before, if fail we have to once again, we must, in Beckett's lapidary phrase, fail better, because this war is everyone's war, perhaps the first real world war. Hello. Uh, well, <laughs> Thank you, John, uh, very much. Um, you know, often when I worked for the BBC, I was accused of um, being a, a pessimist, and I was referred to as Misha Gloomy. Uh, but uh, I think you've slightly outdone me there. <laughs> um, uh, I, it was one of those extraordinary lectures where I had questions formulating in my mind, only for them to be answered five minutes uh, later. But uh, I, I don't want to take up too much time with questions because I'm sure there are a lot from the, from the floor. But uh, just a couple of observations. I think that uh, you identify very, very well that uh, the problem with this war is when you're dealing with a permanent member of the Security Council who, which possesses <coughs> almost half of the world's entire stock of nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads, uh, different rules apply. Um, rules which are very hard to identify and it becomes even harder to find a path to extract oneself, to in, instruct, extract ourselves out of the, out of the crisis. Um, which is one of the reasons I presume why this is so intense as a crisis. Uh, you also, you, you made the point, I noted that you said that Putin has made himself an enemy of the human race. And uh, while I think there's a very strong case uh, for that as an objective statement, um, what worries me is, is that those um, knock-on crises that you refer to, particularly the issue of food supplies and famine, um, Putin himself understands that the West will see him as an enemy of the human race, and he's concentrating his informational war on the other parts of the world who 
if one is to judge by the latest uh, opinion polls which are being uh, published, are as ready to see the West as responsible for this crisis and those dramas uh, regarding food supplies and so on as Putin him, himself. So he's playing to a different, different uh, audience which presumably makes uh, your appeal to the creation of a union of states to act collectively all the more difficult. Would you think that's, that's the case? Well, I certainly think that that is, uh, a, a, that is a real and immediate problem. I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't myself believe it to be the case that actually many people in, um, uh, yes, the parts of the world that... Um, Putin wishes to um, retain, I mean, cooper cooperative relations with, um, necessarily believe what Putin says to them. I think that they have their own um, grief with the uh, West. And uh, so a lot of their response is uh, better understood in terms of that. And uh, I mean, that grief, uh, in, you know, is, is, is not gratuitous. I mean, it's very uh, deeply historically Grounded. So, um, but I think, I mean, the point of what I was trying to say is that it is more than usually important for the political leaderships of those states to recognize what has happened and not to, um, in a way, I mean, to react in terms of their prior uh, personal sentiments. Uh, I mean, they have uh, no reason, well, you know, some of them do have lots of reasons, of course, but I mean, uh, in some sense, collectively, a very large portion of the world has no reasons for, net reasons for affection towards the, the West. I mean, certainly towards um, our country, but, um, but oh, and I would say, you know, actually more recently, uh, nor towards the United States. Um, but... Um, I mean, that is really not a helpful um, uh, way to react from the point of view of their own population. I mean, it is... Uh, I mean, you could say, well, if you think of it, uh, this is a sort of um, competitive political game, which of course it is. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, there's no chance of um, this coming out well. Um, you know, if I was making a bet about how this is going to, uh, my bet wouldn't be it's going to go the way I'm suggesting it would be good for it to do so. But, but I do think that there is a very high degree of, um, yes, I mean, misperception in the political leadership of the states in question. And I, obviously I'm particularly preoccupied with the Chinese state because of its extraordinary power. And uh, I mean, I, it's very easy to see why um, uh, when uh, Putin went to see Xi and said, you know, I'm going to do this, or whatever he did say, who, who knows what he said. He certainly didn't say, what's going to happen is what's happened. I mean, that is quite clear. Um, but um, he, he did, he obviously said, I'm going to um, <laughs> extend my defensive perimeter um, and it'll go swimmingly. Um, but um, I think it was, um, you know, if that, w if that was the full deal, you can see its immediate attractions to um, uh, China's president at the moment. Uh, personal attractions and in some sense also um, the state in its present hands attractions. Um, but, um, I mean, that is a sensational miscalculation of the interests of the Chinese people. That is the point I wanted to make. It could hardly be uh, a, a more foolish judgment. I mean, it has to be just for the uh, necessarily because the human time is quite short by his age. I mean, the purely personal political future of President Xi that this could be a smart thing to do. It's a very, very unsmart thing from the point of view of uh, anyone in China who isn't very closely personally related to him uh, under the age of, you know, 50. But, uh, and of course, when, if you're talking about China, the need to get the message that you were giving this evening here uh, 
to China and the Chinese people, I think, is absolutely vital because that need for cooperation and collective action it overrides, overrides everything. As long as China, and indeed the West for that matter, see it as a sort of a, a game of political competition, then the, uh, am I right in thinking there is no way out from... No, there's certainly no way out if, if it goes on in those terms. And, and I mean, of course, it is true that sometimes the Chinese state um, is, uh, you know, expresses itself in quite lucid terms as understanding that. You know, certainly as lucid terms as, you know, speaking any of our states. And of course, there's much more continuing political um, uh, entity. So, th I mean, that's very important. Um, but um, it, 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 um, it's a structure of interest, like all um, political systems. And the interests of the, uh, I would say, the, it has, you have to be quite a long way up in the, in the pyramid, and, and probably um, you have to be there because of a relatively personal contact with um, the president himself for it to be in your interest, if you think, you know, especially if you have any children or grandchildren or whatever. Um, yes, well, of course, I mean what I've said to get to China, <laughs> but, but it isn't going to be sold on the streets of Beijing. <laughs> yeah. Let me throw it open to the floor now and ask for questions from the floor. Stephen. Well, this was uh, great. Uh, John, yeah, John. <coughs> Would Putin be the enemy of the human species if he had done what he thought he was going to do? I mean, if he'd have invaded, overthrown the government, and been accepted by the Ukrainian people, would he still be the enemy of the human species? There, there, there are two agencies in that sense, it's not one. If Putin had done what he said he uh, intended to have done, uh, well, you know, the Ukrainian people would have had to be not the Ukrainian people. So, I mean, this is, there are but two agencies. Is the crime the invasion? Because this, you, some, at a certain point you said, as the UN Charter, invasion is a crime. It's already a crime. Or is the crime the use in Bello, the, uh, you know, all of the horrors and the, which uh, you do emphasize, of course, very strongly. And the thing that makes the world stomach turn, uh, as you said, all the videos and so on, and makes people, uh, uh, well, this reaction to the, the, the sense of what a sick thing this war is, are the crimes, or not, not the invasion, I'm not sure. Anyway, just, yeah, where, where does the enemy of humanity come in? Well, I, 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 I want to say that it comes in, in uh, my way of putting it, which is that, that um, uh, Putin, well, let's say there are two or three bits to what Putin thought he was doing. One bit was to, um, uh, yes, I mean, to displace a, um, a, a Western intrusion into the rightful territorial uh, domain of the um, of, of Great Rus, um, and um, yeah. I, mean, I would say, I mean, that's a, from my point of view, that's a paradigm case of um, of sort of civilizational narcissism of the most. Um, uh, yes, a barbaric kind. I mean, you can be barbaric as a civilization. Uh, you know, I think uh, all civilizations in their time have been. Um, but, um, I mean, Putin, Putin had a lot of informants on Ukraine. It wasn't that he knew nothing at all about it. Quite a lot of them must have been disinformants, because otherwise he would have been less surprised by what happened. You wouldn't have expected um, to happen what what um, uh, he did expect, um, but um, I mean he must have known 
that it was a completely fatuous claim to make about the, the then government of Ukraine, that actually it was a set of people who um, were, um, yes, I mean, rabid, um, uh, I don't know what the criteria for being a fascist in Putin's vocabulary are, but anyway, uh, uh, let's say a, a rabidly racist. What were they racist? I mean, which was the race they were racist against? Russians? I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, doesn't refer to the space he was thinking of taking over. Um, and, you know, it's not as though there wasn't, a, there weren't files in the Kremlin for, you know, just, just, just elaborate a bit. Um, so there is something particularly insane about this war from his point of view, killing your own. When the Nazis went into the Sudetenland, they didn't kill their <coughs> own who were there. There's, there's something, and I have a feeling that you're, when you're trying to say, talk to the Chinese and show that this is, in a sense, a war against humanity, you're appealing to something. And I think it's something in that, trying to locate where is it that you, because of course in reality, much of the world doesn't think this is a war against humanity. You're trying to convince them it is. Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. So, and the reason, but what, what is your hope or ideal, that, what is the reason you might hope to convince them is because there's something that is truly uh, you know, ghastly about this kind of barbarism and the insanity of it. It's not just conquering territory, or something, but you're killing your own because somehow they're not admitting that they are you. Yes. Well, there are a number of different bits, I suppose, that I would want to use in trying to convince them, but that's certainly one of them. Um, it's the, um, yes, the sort of blind mythic, as it were, elements in it. Um, I, I think that would, um, I think if the Chinese leadership uh, paid attention to that, it would be disconcerted by it, frankly. I, I think that actually it was initially the case that the Chinese leadership was um, uh, not that um, comfortable uh, over the issue of territoriality. I mean, they don't like uh, disputed territorial boundaries. Of course, they particularly dislike their own um, stipulated territorial boundaries, but but they um, don't like generally um, crossing uh, the boundaries of a state in a coercive manner. They are against that. It's their official position, but I think actually it's a relatively sincere official position. I mean, I don't think they're in favour of states being conquered militarily. They don't think that's going to help. Uh, anything much. Uh, I mean, they d certainly don't think Taiwan is a state, and you know, of course, it depends on how you think about it. Uh, I mean, I, what I, I don't have a, uh, you know, I'm not a specialist in IR. I don't know whether you should say Taiwan is a state or Taiwan isn't a state. Uh, I certainly think you should say Taiwan is a democracy insofar as the United States is a democracy or even Britain is a democracy or Austria is a democracy, but I, I, I'm not sure that Taiwan is a state in, in quite a secure sense. Um, uh, well, why am I not? Because it isn't recognized by many other states as being a state. Um, so, you know, it's in, a, it's in a very vulnerable position. But, I mean, I don't think there's any, you know, transfer of um, sort of um, political capital from a Chinese point of view in relation to Taiwan, of what Putin <coughs> is doing in, in Ukraine. I think it's very bad from a Chinese point of view. I mean, there were, you, you know, the, the, well, there are several different bits, aren't there? I mean, uh, the, Russia is a guarantee, guarantor of the security of Ukraine as a state under the Budapest Memorandum. You know, that's an impressive performance, certainly. Um, it's, um, and it, you know, it's a, Ukraine is supposed to be an independent state. It's just not supposed to be independent in the way it's, it's, you know, chosen to be. That's the crime. Well, I don't think the Chinese are, you know, very sympathetic to that line either. I, I don't see, I don't think, what I want to say to the Chinese government is, you know, however helpful it might have looked in the short term in relation to Taiwan, you don't have a dog in this fight and you must not join it. 
they do have a dog in the fight in as much that their junior partner in this alliance has chosen the timing and the nature of the confrontation of the West, which, ex which is extremely inconvenient uh, and detrimental to Chinese interests. Well, I suppose you can think of it as the Chinese dog having been dragged into the fight. Yeah. But I think that, you know, that the, the, you know, the, <laughs> the practical um, implication of that is to get it out of the fight fast. <laughs> um, any other questions before I go to the floor again? Just to remind anyone, everyone, in case you don't know, the good news is is that uh, when we finished here in five or ten minutes, we have wine and cheese downstairs, which is uh, bound to cheer us up. Um, Hi, um, thank you very much for this very pr provocative and interesting lecture. I. I um, had a question as I was listening about um, the war and specifically the new forms of war that we have seen in the 21st century. And I was curious how you see um, the advent of things like drone warfare, which keep war for many people in, in Europe and the United States very, very far away as changing one's perception of what war is and how awful it can be in a way that perhaps has left people somewhat unprepared or at a poor footing to respond to the war in Ukraine today? Well, I suppose I, I do think that um, uh, people had forgotten war. Uh, and that uh, drone warfare, you know, is not real war in people's imaginations. I mean, it's a, I mean, it is a, obviously, it has some attractions to the people who have the drones. But I don't know that there are any real successes in drone warfare. And I, I mean, it doesn't seem to me a you know, promising development from a human point of view. I, I, I mean, humans are very inventive and they invent um, ways of um, murdering each other, you know, uh, without knowing that they'll go on doing that. I mean, that's barbarity, as it were, from my point of view. I don't mean I necessarily think every single use of a drone by let's I don't know that the British government has, has any drones or I, I certainly don't know of any occasion on which it's used any drones if it does have them um, but um, I mean the United States has used quite a lot really and uh, some of them have clearly been uh, very uh, bad judgments and yeah I would say uh, possibly quite strong candidates for war crimes actually. I'm not a specialist in that area but I would think that, that you know there, are, there must be international legal grounds for doubting the legitimacy of using that sort of weapon because of its um, uh, I mean its attractions are its extreme precision but, uh, but it, uh, actually it isn't extremely precise in use. Man, I'm at the back. Thank you, Professor Dunn. As I've confessed to you earlier, I'm a big fan, so please indulge me with my question. Uh, there were two references, one in the beginning of your talk uh, and one towards the end when my question pertains to both. Uh, I'm wondering, perhaps I did not get it clearly, but what is the, civili the reference to civilization? Um, what is the work civilization, reference to civilization doing in a thesis on war and barbarity? If at all the allusion is to differences between civilizations, then one must, I suppose, be a little attentive to the normative weights that are attached to civilizational differences in all whether it's Samuel Huntington or in general uh, with any kind of uh, analysis. Um, and the second is uh, uh, to the fact, to your reference to more than any other war, this war is a war on humanity and it is everyone's war. While I do understand that Russia today poses an unmitigated nuclear threat to the entire world, uh, what would you say to uh, Palestinians, to Kashmiris, to Rohingyas in Myanmar, uh, whose wars were never uh, the wars of the world, so to say. Um, why must one therefore 
uh, consider this war, which is so distant uh, from many uh, geographical contexts of the world, as their own? Well, I don't. Uh, I think you misunderstood what I was saying. If you thought that I was applauding uh, the occurrence of war in any of those uh, instances, I mean, I, I, I think war is just generally a very, very bad and sad thing. But, um, and I meant to um, underline my, uh, my picture of the world, which is a world in which a very large number of people in a very large number of places are in um, great pain. Um, and I'm afraid likely to continue to be so. My, my point wasn't that, um, wasn't that, if you like, that um, the local wars in places uh, outside the European continent are in si any sense at all less important or less um, a reason for um, grief. My point was that actually this particular war is having a global effect of a kind which is very, very seriously damaged in what very small chance there is of the world as a viable human habitat um, being there in a century's time. Um, and I, I mean, that is not true of the war in Yemen, I mean, or the war in um, uh, Myanmar. I mean, it just isn't. Um, uh, so uh, it's not that those wars are, you know, less dreadful, but they're less globally consequential. I was trying to talk about the global, or if you like, species <coughs> consequentiality of this war. And I, I think that's right, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the central thing I wanted to say is uh, human beings have behaved in uh, large quantities very, very badly for a very long time. And um, there's no chance whatever of they're all sort of snapping out of it and behaving well from now on. But, but it really is essential for them to stop behaving badly in one particular way on a very large scale now. It really is essential now for them to do so. What, what's, what's the word civilization doing in my title? Well, I meant to say that I use civilization as the placeholder for uh, large scale um, evaluative orientation for human populations. Um, the largest scale there's been so far. And um, I, you know, in the first instance, um, assume that uh, all civilizations, I mean, I'm, I'm, not so, I'm not an anthropologist, so I don't actually take it as an item of faith that every civilization is of equal merit. I don't suppose that sentence even makes sense for an anthropologist, but I don't know. I've never understood exactly what they thought they thought. Because, and I strongly suspect they don't understand it either. But um, in any case, um, I don't, uh, it's not my view that every civilization they, there has been represents the same level of uh, human civilizational achievement. But I do think insofar as there has been really large scale human imaginative achievement in thinking about how it's good or bad for humans to live, the civilization is the largest unit that you can make sense of supposing uh, to, it to be located in. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, you know, I specifically don't think what um, Huntington thought, which is, you know, it's in the nature of civilizations to, um, you know, to be up for um, uh, brutalizing each other. I mean, I'm trying to say, insofar as they're civilizations rather than sort of um, uh, instances of barbarity clothed in um, civilized raiment, um, uh, th then uh, I, th 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 their uh, hostilities and their um, you know, zest for clashing um, is, uh, you know, deeply um, uh, incoherent from an evaluative point of view. It, it's, it cancels their value. Um, so I don't think, I, I don't think that you 
quite understood that part of what I was saying. I'm sure it was my fault that you didn't. Well, thank you very much. I think on, on that we should all um, take ourselves downstairs for some of the wine and cheese and we can carry on the conversation there. But before we do, please, a round of applause once again for John Dunn. Thank you.